Well, Pete, let's start with the inner solar system as usual and work our way out. Um, Mercury. So it's actually quite well placed uh, this month. Uh, greatest eastern elongation occurs on the 10th of February uh, when it will be 18.2 degrees east of the sun. So that's pretty good. So it's an evening sky object and fairly well placed. That's right. It'll be um, it'll join its uh, solar system neighbour, um, Venus. So it's uh, two nice planets to look out for in the evening twilight. Um, the separation remains pretty good, actually, doesn't it, for Mercury um, for much of the month, even though the, the brightness a drop so uh, probably you're going to lose it what about the 20th of the month 20th of february um, yes but uh, between then and the start of the month you should grab some clear skies and be able to see it there low down in the evening sky well, let's keep fingers crossed at least <laughs> okay well venus is pretty it's, spectacular it is it? it's the dominant thing it's like a brilliant lantern in the evening sky the thing is you get used to venus being there when it's like this and then when it's gone you do feel an absence that it's no longer present well um, it's, it reaches inferior conjunction on the 3rd of june so that's the time when it will disappear but throughout may it'll just disappear really quickly it does it drops away very quickly so don't get complacent with venus enjoy it while it's there but no, it and i have to say uh putting my uh mercury and venus section director hat on for the british astronomical association we've had some splendid images through as uh, particularly in uv showing some really interesting structure in the clouds so it's an interesting it's... planet to try and observe it's a tricky planet to image actually in uh, the uv because um a lot of um telescopes have coatings on them the ones with um, front lenses or corrector like plates SCT. an SCT or Max Sutov Cassegrains have a, a coating on which actually gets rid of the UV so you uh, lose a lot of that signal so that's going to make it so it, don't be totally surprised then if your images are fairly bland of, uh, of Venus if you're using that type of telescope you need an open tube scope like a Newtonian reflector that's um, probably best I'm, but then I'm a Newtonian reflector lover, so I oh, will agree with that. Oh, you would be, but your, your imaging is rubbish. So the, <laughs> you're a sketcher. I am. Yes. I am. A visual um, observer, please. A please. visual observer. <laughs> OK, so um, on the 1st of February, if you get a telescope to look at Venus, you'll see that it's three quarters lit. About so 73%. Yeah, yeah a, gibbous, um, a gibbous disc. Quite big, actually, 15 arc seconds across. That's not bad at all. It is. It's a it's pretty good size. Uh, but as we get towards the end of the month, uh, it really does get a a lot better. So by the 29th of February, because this is a leap year, um, it will be only 62% illuminated, but 18 arc seconds across. And as we go through now into March and April, uh, it will get closer to us getting brighter. The phase will decrease more and more, and the disk size will get larger and larger. The other good thing about it is that it's up for a long time after sun has set. So it's up for um, over four hours at the end of the month, which means that um, as the sun's um, altitude goes lower and lower beneath the horizon, so the sky gets truly dark and you see Venus in a dark sky. And that's when it's, to the naked eye at least, it's when it's really visually striking. And it is so dazzling. But of course, telescopically, that's not the greatest time it's awful, to <laughs> observe it. Uh, anybody who is uh, thinking of doing visual observation of Venus should try some of the filters that will have come with a telescope, yellow, blue, red. These all allow us to see into different levels, depths of the Venus atmosphere and see different markings. So, well worth doing. Do you, as a matter of interest, if you're if you're observing Venus visually through the eyepiece, do you ever use a a dimming filter, like a neutral density filter, to reduce the glare? No, a, a yellow filter does that. A yellow filter, uh, so something like if you look on the side of your filter, it will give a number. So something yeah. like a 15, a Raton 15, really does tidy up the image. It's uh, a thick enough filter, so it does reduce the glare, okay. and it helps to boost the contrast of the fainter features, and including the cusp caps as well the, the, that cover the poles. So a general yellow filter is enough. Uh, if you've got a larger telescope, uh, a, a really dark blue filter or violet filter like a 47 really does bring out the images but you do need to collect a lot of light for that so okay. six inch telescope or larger right so let's head out uh, into the uh, the more outer part of the solar system now skipping over the earth and we'll head to mars now mars is a morning planet um rising a couple of hours before the sun and it's actually pretty low in the sky 
but it's it's telescopically quite small but it's actually going through at the end of the month anyway it's five arc second limit that's when you start to draw that's when i start to observe although i might start a bit earlier now because i have a 12 inch telescope but traditionally that's when i would typically start five i think convincingly to see anything five arc seconds is probably it's, about that it's an bit. interesting planet because it's going to be quite tricky for a few months because it it's in a low part of the um, the sky. In fact, on the 18th of February, it passes between um, M8 and M20 in Sagittarius. So, so that shows how low it is. Yeah, that's, that's the Joining the other planets that are all <laughs> over there. <laughs> They're all clustering down there. So M8 is, of course, the Lagoon Nebula and M20 is the um, the Trifid Nebula. I guess that's the right way to say. Trifid or Trifid? Well, Trifid. Trifid always conjures up those weird plants. Oh, the alien plants John from Wyndham's the film. books. Yeah, that's right. So um, it, it actually the name comes about because it, it, it talks about the the shadow lines, or not shadow, the dark dust lanes which go across the nebula, and they divide it into three. That's where it gets its name from. Right. Um, so. Um, Say it how you like, I guess. But it, it will be passing between those two uh, nebulae on the 18th of February. So if you've got a camera... That's a nice photo opportunity. Yes. Um, we've, you mentioned the other planets all congregating very low down. So we've got Jupiter and we've got Saturn. In fact, they form a line with Mars in the early morning sky. They're not very well placed for telescopic viewing. No, they are very low down and possibly hidden by trees if you've got those on your horizon. But uh, they'll get a bit better next month. Saturn is actually better placed now than it was a couple of years back. So we are slowly regaining the gas giants back from the southern hemisphere. Yeah. As we go as we go into the the middle of the year, it's quite interesting. I think it's in um, May. You've got um, Saturn, which is just inside Capricornus, and Jupiter, which is just inside Sagittarius. So they're either side of the border, <laughs> but they are creeping out of Sagittarius. They are slowly rising out of the murk. <laughs> All right. Well, further out, we've got our ice giants. So Uranus um, is an evening planet, but it's rapidly losing altitude now as darkness falls. Uh, so we've only really got to Uranus for uh, for the rest of the month or so. And Neptune, um, dim object, it's still, ve it's still available, but it's started to be swallowed by the, the evening twilight now. So we haven't got long for Uranus and Neptune, really. No, that's right. OK, well, let's have a look at some of the specials um, which are happening throughout the month. There are a number of Claire obscure effects occurring. Um, these are tricks of the light. We've got um, the face in Albategnius, which is visible on the 1st of February. That's where the, um, the rim of the crater casts a shadow on the floor of the crater, and it looks like the profile of a human face. I've seen images of it. I've never actually seen it with my own eyes. So okay. Well, what's, watch for. what's got Plato's hook? This is an interesting one. This is an interesting one. For, for a while, I think it was thought to be an illusion, wasn't it, that the whole isn't actually curved but under certain types of illumination it might be that the crater rim does make it look slightly hooked it's still a bit of an open debate I think well I, I it's supposed to be the gamma peak on the um, on the rim of Plato and it's supposed to cast a shadow across the floor of the crater um, you should be able to see this actually on the the morning oh, sorry on the evening of the 2nd of February but that shadow it's sort of like a tooth um, like an incisor, <laughs> it looks like, and it's supposed to appear curved. Now, I think this actually came about, it's through Patrick. I, I've so, I remember looking actually in one of Patrick's lunar log books, I do forget which one, where this, I think he made, I wouldn't swear to this, but I think he made the observation with the then lunar section director, H.P. Wilkins. He did indeed, yes. Uh, and showing this, I think Wilkins has a sketch of it as well. I think they did it at the Murdon refractor, the 33 inch That's refractor. That's right. Uh, showing this, but I'm not sure if it's ever been repeated either visually or imagery. -wise. Well, it's interesting because the I know what that peak looks like very well. I know what the shadow looks like very well. Um, and as being a shadow, it should have straight edges. And mm. of course, they recorded it as being curved. But there is actually there's a region on the terrace of the rim, the inner terrace of the rim, where um, if the shadows fall correctly, they just fall inside of the rim. Um, around the base of a very rugged region. Okay. Now that looks like a curving hooked shadow yeah. yes. and I'm wondering whether because the, their observation was made really quickly yeah it wasn't they weren't looking for this they just reported it as a curved shadow whether they picked up that rather than the gamma peak shadow it might could well have been and of course if the seeing was only averaged again that would help with that kind of effect so it's definitely something worth watching out for 
I think that should be that should be quite interesting, shouldn't it? So, um, yeah. Okay. Well, let's head out into the stars then and have a look at the uh, constellations which we've got. Um, we've still got the stars of winter, which are really quite obvious to us they um, are this is uh, orion in particular now orion the hunter is i think the most recognizable constellation in the night sky this is now passing towards the west and it will disappear quite quickly it will as the um, as the the daylight period uh, expands rapidly and orion gradually moves to the west he just gets engulfed really really fast but Orion's been in the headlines, of course, recently uh, because we. <laughs> oh dear, that doesn't sound good. Um, it, because the star in the upper uh, left corner of Orion, or the northeast corner, is Betelgeuse, um, yes. which is a red supergiant star it is. and often cited as the star most likely to go into a supernova phase. It will certainly go supernova. Close, one of the closest ones that will go. It will go supernova, um, and. Over the last few months, of course, it has been reported that it's started to fade, which has caused a lot of conjecture about whether it's going to go supernova really quite yeah, soon. I, what, what slightly irks me a little uh, is that it's been hyped up, as if this is a sudden phenomenon. In actual fact, uh, observers that follow these kind of stars, these are variable stars, stars that change their brightness over time. Yeah. Uh, Observers that follow variable stars will tell you that this isn't unusual. This type of star, Betelgeuse, does do this. And it went very faint, I think, in 1978. It got down to magnitude plus 1.8, which is quite faint. Yeah. And again, in the 80s, there's nothing new. It doesn't, you can't infer just because it's doing that that it's going to go supernova. And one of the great problems with these types of stars, Betelgeuse in particular, is we're not sure how long it's been in this red giant, supergiant phase. Right, for. okay. So it could go supernova by the time this goes out in March. Or or it might be another thousand or so years before anything I happens. I think the, the estimate was always sort of up to about 100,000, maybe in a million years to yes, go. Yes, because there's considerable uncertainty about how long it's been in this phase for. Um, of course, when it does go supernova, the core that remains won't be heavy enough to form a black hole. No. Uh, it will just become a, an ordinary sort of... I mean, it would be sort of... spectacular, but wishing for it to happen isn't going to make it happen. No, and just because it's doing uh, dropping in magnitude doesn't mean it's going to happen either. No. Um, I'm afraid the universe isn't there at our convenience and our pleasure to, <laughs> to, to put on fireworks for us. We just have to take what there is. <laughs> you disappoint me, Paul. So, um, OK, so we've got... Betelgeuse up in the uh, northeast corner of Orion. Of course, you've got the three stars in the middle of Orion, which form Orion's belt, very easy to spot. If you follow the line they make down to the left, so that's to the southeast, that points at Sirius, which is the brightest star in the night sky. Uh, if you go above Sirius and slightly to the east or to the left, you come to a star which is bright in a region of sky more or less on its own, that's Procyon, yes. the brightest star in Canis Minor. And if you join Procyon to Betelgeuse to Sirius <laughs> back to Procyon, you form the Winter Triangle, which is a, a large asterism. A very, very large asterism. But uh, it's an interesting asterism because you've got the winter Milky Way that flows down through it um, and you've got that large constellation of Monoceros which is really quite faint and difficult to make out. It is, uh, largely because there isn't a lot of things in it. Well, you there's say not that... many bright stars. No, though. there aren't it's, many bright it's stars. It's very difficult and it's low down so if there's any winter mist and haze it's going to be very difficult It gets to lost, out. doesn't it? But it has got quite a few deep sky objects in there. Of there's course, the Rosette Nebula, isn't it? The Rosette there? is beautiful. I remember looking for that when uh, I was a small boy with a, a telescope oh. pointing it in that region and all you can see it's is very little I had the same well, you see uh, the cluster place. right in the you center you do and, uh, and I was uh, the first I'll confess up the first time I did it I was overjoyed because there was all this nebulosity around it and I thought oh goodness me you know that's not bad for a four inch refractor uh, actually all that's happened is my eye had warmed up the eyepiece <laughs> and, <my condensation. laughs> and once I removed the condensation um, the mist the mist disappeared completely as did all the nebulosity so that's, I've never returned to it so well that's an interesting an interesting thing as well you see because there is an expectation when you're looking for these there things is. that you're going to see them and if 
um, something happens like you've just described, you can easily convince yourself you're seeing something which isn't actually there. Yeah. So you I, have... I, I got suspicious as the nebulosity increased more and more <laughs> after five minutes, and I was already dark adapted, and then I took the eyepiece out and saw it was just steamed over. But nonetheless, invaluable lessons to learn. <laughs> well, I, I have seen the rosette through a telescope, but only when it had a, a nebula filter fitted, and um, it's really quite dim. But the, the cluster in the centre is pretty obvious. That's NGC 2244, and it always reminds me of the, the dots on a, a dice which represent the number six. Okay. Um, so it's sort of two lines of three. But you've got other things in there as well. You've got the um, the Christmas tree cluster. Um, it's Actually, this is a very awkward part of the sky because it's got loads of designations. It's got the Christmas tree cluster, um, the Christmas tree nebula, and you've got loads of things there. You've got the cone nebula, the fox fern nebula. It's just a, a mishmash of many different things. And it's a beautiful area to photograph, but they're all pretty faint. And quite difficult to say. I think a lot of these things have, the, apart from the, the, the open clusters, of course, a lot of the nebulae do have a low surface brightness. They so do. So picking them out can be difficult. I think the Christmas tree cluster itself is quite nice because it, it does look like a traditional shape of a Christmas tree with the variable star S. Manorosaurotis marking the tree trunk um, of the tree and then you can sort of if you've got a good imagination you can pick out the Christmas tree shape but it does, it does come out fairly well um, <laughs> okay. but there is another interesting object in Manorosaurus which I, I really like I remember the first time I saw this um, and that's the star Beta Manorosaurotis yes and if you t put a small telescope at this it splits it into the three components uh, I can't remember whether I think they are gravitationally bound they are at least so yes. there's three stars all going around the common centre of gravity and it really is quite a pretty sight it's beautiful it's really beautiful it's like a it always sounds a weird thing to say, but it's a bit like a bent line. But it, but they do look like they belong together. Yes. And they are, they are pretty, pretty good to look at. So there is stuff to look at in Monoceros. It's just finding the constellation itself. But um, the Winter Triangle is a good guide to it. Anyway, there's plenty to look at in the February night sky. So um, everyone should wrap up warm and clear skies to everyone. Yeah. Thanks, Paul. Thanks, Pete.